Well, after my recent success in making the Tsaritsa and NPC videos, it's back to being irrelevant and inconsistent with video uploads again. I hope that changes one day, but that day is unfortunately not today. Anyways, thanks to everyone for supporting my channel. And, well, we're back after a bit of hiatus. I didn't play the Archon Quest until December 21st, which now compelled me to make this video. It gave me the inspiration I needed to push myself to make a review, despite my, uh, recent bad health. It's fine though, I'll be okay soon. So, the Archon Interlude Quest, or should I say, the official Scaramouche chapter. These are just first impressions, so I'm sure there are plenty of deep diving going on that has a better idea of what's happening. I might make a follow-up video on some of the elements in this chapter, uh, but that's not a promise. I'm really bad at keeping video promises, as I've discovered. There's quite a lot of topics in here to delve into, so I'll just start now. First off, this quest, it was great. Certainly not as dramatic nor tense as the previous interlude quest, and if I were to compare it to all the Sumeru Archon quest, it would be 4th place behind Acts 5, 4, and 2. Uh, but that doesn't mean I was disappointed. This chapter was everything it needed to be. It retained writing elements that I really appreciated in Act 5, like the payoff from the two NPCs that we saw at the beginning of the chapter. One thing I will regrettably say is that I had a hard time following the notes they gave me at the start. I feel like I should be onto smaller details like this now. Genshin lore is filled with miscellaneous writings on just about any random item from artifacts to weapons to books, and so I'm not yet at the level of detail required to turn this channel into a serious hardcore lore analysis. I still have a long way to go before I can be considered on that level. Uh, fortunately for me though, the story presentation of those events later in the chapter meant I didn't have to worry about it. Okay, I'll have to apologize in advance for what I'm about to say next, because I honestly enjoyed Paimon here the least out of all the quests so far. Her best moments were in Sumeru Act 2 with the Samsara chapter, so I'll give her flowers where it's due. I'm not a Paimon hater, just so we're clear. But come on, Paimon here was perhaps the most annoying she's ever been, and that's coming from someone who finds her less annoying than most people do. When she saw Scaramouche, she basically lost her composure and was questioning why Nahida thought it was a good idea to work with him. But Paimon's worried about you, Nahida! Don't let him trick you! <laughs> it's not every day you see people questioning the God of Wisdom's judgment. Just when you think you've seen it all. Don't you dare try to drive a wedge between us! Like, yeah, boy, you tell her. Why does the dumbest person in the room feel the need to distrust the God of Wisdom? who knows Skara the best out of anyone? Like, bruh. No disrespect, but Paimon, you're not that person. You ain't it. Anyways, moving on. If you're a Skara Moosh fan, you really got a feel for him throughout this whole chapter. If not, well, I still think the story was written well enough to enjoy it regardless. The Ermin Soul flashback has to be one of the hardest hitting scenes I've seen in this game. This gives me vibes back when Raman learned the truth about King Deshret and Greater Lord Ruka Devada. They're almost exact parallels. They learned that everything they believe was founded on lies. But the difference is, Raman, I assume, didn't walk past the point of no return. Skara had already changed and destroyed a lot of people's lives, so it was already too late. So on to the flashback itself. It was all just a setup. Dottore infiltrated the Tatarasuna and orchestrated these events. It was really naive of me to believe that Dottore couldn't get any more evil than he already has. But before I dive into that, I want to nitpick because that's what I do best. First off, this face. This face has to be the most evil face I've seen in this game. It's so creepy, so unsettling. Like fam. Second. If Niwa distrusted Easter, why did he allow himself to be alone with this guy, completely defenseless, with him openly carrying a knife on his back? Sorry, I'd have believed the optics more if he was armed and just got simply overwhelmed, or if he was in a room with armed soldiers, but the doctor just overpowered everyone. This line here, Think of me as a monster or a demon, if you wish. At least this way your death is not a consequence of your own folly turning you into an easy target. 
you simply lost to something more powerful than you could ever hope to defeat. I think Easter was just making fun of him at this point. It was way too easy. Unfortunately, it wouldn't have changed anything because the Tori is overpowered, but still. You could have at least tried. Well, fortunately for the writers, there was no chance that Niwalk would survive against the Fatui Harbinger, so it wasn't too big of a deal. Aside from the flawed execution, it was a great cutscene and I liked it. It turns out there was no second betrayal. Scaramouche was loved and appreciated back then and it could have just ended there. Now let's move on to the Jester. Piero, the first Fatui Harbinger. We've gotten a lot more about this guy than I was expecting. I have a feeling that he's going to be relevant even further to the end of the Tsaritsa. Especially since we've learned that he met the Abyss sibling and probably stuff happened between them. Are the two allies? What stains leave connection to them? Perhaps those questions won't even be answered in Stejnaya, and Conria would be the Piero and Dainsley chapter. Also, he really has it in for Inazuma, doesn't he? He planned out the Tatarasuna infiltration and the events of the Vision Hunt decree. He was the mastermind behind the uh, distribution of manufactured illusions in Inazuma. I think I'll have to pay more attention to any reference of him in the future. He's really racking up the crimes to his name and... Well, I kind of want him to be playable, but right now it doesn't seem to be moving in that direction. But yeah, huge endgame character, he's gotten a lot of hype and build up this quest and I'm excited for his future. Another thing I want to talk about is specifically the means to recruit the other Harbingers. The way a plan was executed to manipulate Scaramouche's feelings to join the Harbingers, questions would need to be raised about how the others were recruited. The Tori flashback was a massive game changer because now we must ask, who else was manipulated into joining the Harbingers, and who chose them organically? Child might have to be a legitimate one, but Scaramouche wasn't. He would have never joined on his own. Okay, next I'd like to talk about the Ermansol in this chapter. Okay, I am so happy they did this. They explored the memory exposure thing with Nahida and the others. I thought after Greater Lord Ruka Devada was erased, Nobody else would ever find out that their memories were being tampered with. I did not expect them to sidestep it so quickly and for them to counter it like this, it makes me feel happy. I really hope the Ermansoul memory plot point gets more focus in future quests and eventually people learn the truth because this experience was getting more and more lonely for the Traveler. Just to imagine more and more people get erased and change history and eventually the world believes in a radically different reality than you do. I have a feeling we must talk to another Descender at this point, someone who has been living in Teyvat for far longer. What other sorts of secrets were erased that we do not know about? Uh, what's next? Oh. Going through Scaramouche's memories and the Wanderer discovering his true identity. Okay, this is just me being fresh off the Archon quest and not fully understanding how it happened, but I have to ask. How did Nahida upload all the Scaramouche memories after it was completely erased in the Urban Soul? I know she made an allegory story to dodge the Urban Soul correction, but how would she have perfectly replicated the flashbacks from just that? It couldn't have come from the Traveler. Because there were several scenes that the Traveler didn't know about. I'll look for answers to this later, but for now I'm just posing the question in case someone knows. Uh, now moving on. Again, some minor comments. The scene with Senora was hilarious. It had to be the highlight of the Wanderer flashbacks. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit mean to Senora here, but still. Imagine Scar's reaction when he found out. Another thing I noticed was that he could have easily saved Senora's life by telling her that he already had the Gnosis, and they would just leave together. He left her for dead at the hands of the Traveler, like for real. There's a mysterious voice that shows up at the end when it showed Paimon's broken vase on the ground, and I can't make too much of it right now. Maybe it will get its own video? I also want to make a Piero video soon too, uh, but we're nearing the end of this review, and some closing thoughts on the Wanderer. Okay, first off, I don't think it was a good decision to drip market the Wanderer as a playable character before the release of this quest. It really spoiled the ending. We didn't know for sure what would happen if we didn't know he was playable, and maybe we'd think he was really gone for a second. I think releasing him for a future patch like 3.4 or 3.5 and having someone like Dia or Alhaitham released now would have been better. 
A lot of suspense in the story ends up being lost because marketing development shows us where the story is going. Second, overall thoughts on the character of Scaramouche and the Wanderer. This quest was just for him. And it was more impactful than any story quest we would have gotten. I'm okay with how his character arc ended and I thought it made sense. The Niwa revelation was what ultimately changed him. I don't think anything else would have worked. Anyways, I won't drag this review any longer than it needs to be. Solid 8.5 out of 10 quest. Probably one of the best interludes alongside the chasm featuring Yelan, Ito, and Xiao. And more theory videos from this will spawn. So that's it then. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.